For thousands of years, what has set us apart as a species is our ability to identify a problem and then devise a tool to solve that problem. It's hard to say why we got so good at doing this. Was it out of intelligence, inspiration, or was it just out of pure laziness? Our ability to improvise is one of our most important tools. Sometimes our improvisations are not very well conceived. Ah. Sometimes they can just be very inefficient. And sometimes they can be downright disastrous. It's important to choose the right tool for the job. What if we don't know exactly what the job is, and we don't have any tools at the moment? How do we choose which tools to buy in the first place? Well, let's take a look at that. So let's talk about the craft that I know best, boat building. One of my followers said they're starting a boat building apprenticeship and they wanted to know what tools should they get to start with. I'm gonna go over the kinds of things you should have in your toolkit if you were to walk into any boat building school or an apprenticeship. Okay, we're not gonna talk about power tools or machines or screwdrivers and wrenches and all that sort of stuff. This is the bare bones kit that you as an individual would be expected to have as your personal tools. Almost everything else is probably gonna be available in the shop you're working in. What we're going to talk about first is what I think is the most important tool, and that's your apron. So we're not talking about this, a carpenter's apron. This is pretty useless for boat building. At best, if you can pull your pouches off and just use one of them, that could work okay. Too much bulk is just going to get in your way. When you're boat building, you're often putting yourself into awkward positions, and often you're working on something large in a tight space. You need to try and keep yourself kind of scaled down in terms of size. When I was going to boat building school, a lot of guys wore bib overalls or Carhartts. Some wore full coveralls. None of those ever worked very well for me. My preference was always for this sort of apron. I like having pencils close at hand and other measuring tools. One thing we use a lot of is finishing nails. So you're always gonna have a pocket full of finishing nails and probably a few assorted screws and other little bits and pieces. As you can see, my aprons are quite possibly the most used tool in my shop. You can buy aprons, of course, but it's hard to find ones that are pretty good quality. I suggest you make one if you can. When you get into any sort of hands-on industry like this, you really need to think about taking care of your own personal safety. Don't rely on someone else to do it for you. First and foremost is making sure you have some safety glasses that are comfortable to you, ones that you're gonna wear. Hearing protection is really important. It's one area that people often ignore, especially in the woodworking industry. Earmuffs are your best protection. Disposable earplugs are okay, but I don't really like using them. I recommend getting some custom cast earplugs. You're gonna spend a little bit of money on those, probably about 75 to 100 bucks to have a set made, but they're well, well worth it. I'll put these in and leave them in for long periods of time because they're so comfortable that I don't even notice it. What's great about them is they, they cut out all the high decibels, but they still allow lower sounds to get through. So you can have a conversation with somebody while still wearing them. Find yourself a really comfortable respirator. Now you can get different cartridges depending on what you're dealing with, whether it's just sawdust or paint fumes or whatever. This particular one is silicone. It feels really good on the face. I don't begrudge putting it on and that's what's really important. Cheap paper dust masks usually don't do the job very well. And I hate to tell you, as romantic as having a beard is, it doesn't do a thing for keeping dust out of your lungs. You need to be clean shaven if you want these to work properly. If you have to absolutely have to have a beard, consider getting a full face mask instead. Okay, let's talk about some of the simplest tools you're going to use, and that would be hammers. Any one of these hammers can do the job that we need done in boat building, but a few of these are going to do it better than others. A typical framing hammer, too big, too long, and pretty much totally useless in boat building, so don't even bother with one of those. Your typical carpenter's hammer is probably okay, but you often don't need one even that big. My preference is for a smaller, let's say 12 ounce claw hammer like this, or you could even get away with a small eight ounce one. Most of the time, we're just using these to put in finishing nails. What you're more likely to see more use of is a ball peen hammer or a cross peen hammer. We use these for riveting, which is common in wooden boat building. Either one of them can do the job fairly well, but the ball peen is my preference. What I like about it is it packs a fair bit of weight into a very small space. If you have to do the driving of nails or tapping of things in tight quarters, the ball peen does a really nice job of it. I even use this for hitting chisels. If I had to pick just one of these hammers to use for boat building, would be the little eight ounce ball peen. Let's move on to the next important area, marking and measuring. Where marking and measuring is concerned, we have three levels of accuracy. At the rough end, you might want something like some chalk or a carpenter's crayon. These are useful for just very bold 
general markings like where to rough cut a board, making notes on something like which plank needs to come out or which rib is rotten. Next are pencils. Your typical carpenter's pencil is fine for general stuff, but usually just a bit too bold for doing accurate work. You're more likely to use a standard pencil. Now when you find ones that you really like, get a whole bunch because you're going to go through these a lot. These are probably one of the most important tools in your boat building kit. And while you're at it, you need to learn how to sharpen them. With a block plane, shave one side of it down nice and flat. We sharpen the other edges till we have a nice sharp taper. And the next level of precision is a knife. You can get yourself a fancy little marking knife and that's just fine. A standard utility knife is going to do the same job just as well and you're probably going to use it a lot more around the boat shop. So if you walk up to me at any given moment, these three things are in my apron. Next are squares. Now these speed squares are pretty handy actually and you can use them for jigging things up or use them uh, just for rough work around the boat shop. You don't ever really use these for fine stuff. Just the same, I would get one just because they're so cheap. Now when it comes to a combination square, Having a little six inch one is invaluable. This is gonna live in your apron all the time and you're gonna be using it all day long. Buy a high quality six inch combination square. These ones are stare at squares. You can expect to spend somewhere close to a hundred bucks for this little guy. If you're gonna put some money into a square, I would put it into the little six inch combination square. You can always get by with a cheaper, larger one. We spend a lot of time playing around with angles in boat building. So one of these sliding T-bevel squares are pretty important. We'll just call them bevel squares for short. Now your typical one is going to have a little wing nut here or this little swinging lever. They're fine, but they're not great. Often the wing nut or the lever is kind of in your way. A better choice is a higher quality one like this Veritas square. It's got a little lever that pops out in this direction and so you just press it down to lock it in place. They work great. Now it's a good idea to have a large one on hand, but you also need a small one on hand. In fact, most of the time taking angles off of small parts. So I would recommend a little three or four inch one. Veritas also makes a little guy like this, which is great. But you know what? The one you're gonna find in my apron is this one right here, which I made myself. This is a really simple shop project and it's a great one for you to start with. It basically costs you nothing. It's just as good a bevel square as the rest of these. If I had to reduce my toolbox down, I'd get rid of those. I would have a decent quality one of these on hand, but I would put my effort into making a little small one like this yourself. No moving parts except for the blade. No locking mechanism. Just a friction fit is all you need. Of all of these, that's the one you're gonna find in my apron. Now compass or dividers are pretty important in boat building. There's a process we call spiling that uses them. Little tiny ones are fine for picking dimensions off of a set of plans, but you don't really need them. What I recommend is a larger set of about six inches or eight inches. And if you're gonna get anything, I would recommend just you get a compass. You can always mount a hard stylus into this if you want to. You'll use this pencil compass feature most often. The one that you find in my toolbox all the time is this one. This is worth spending a bit of money on. When I got this, it was shockingly expensive for me, but I bought it anyway, and I haven't regretted it ever since. A simple awl or ice pick is really useful in boat building. We use it for transferring pattern shapes down onto pieces of wood. We use it for digging around in holes. We use it for all sorts of things. These are so cheap, you should not have one. Now, marking gauges are pretty much a furniture maker's tool. They do come in handy for doing marking and layout of joinery and things like that. They're not absolutely vital. Whatever these can do, you can do with a combination square, but I like to have one on hand. My preference is for this traditional style that has a little cutting blade in it. Naturally, you're gonna be using a tape measure at some point. Your larger wide blade contractor style tape measure I don't think is very useful in boat building. Uh, you can have one on hand, but you won't use it very often. You're far better off with a smaller 16 foot tape. This particular style is really nice because it has what they call a story pole feature. That means it's got one edge that's left blank and this, the blade of this tape is actually made so it can accept a pencil mark very easily. That allows you to use this to sort of mark dimensions directly off something that you're building and then carry them to wherever you need to without worrying about the numbers. Using story poles or what we call tick sticks in boat building is extremely common and this kind of tape can really come in handy. A little torpedo level, a string line, and a plumb bob. Now you don't use these all the time but they certainly do come in handy. These little torpedo levels are really cheap so there's no point in not having one. You're only talking about five or ten bucks to get your hands on one of these and they're 
and even a cheap one is probably accurate enough for the for what you're going to use it for. We use these a lot for leveling up building jigs. You need something that's small that can line up with smaller surfaces that you might need to plumb up. Now the string line obviously is for laying out long straight lines and we do use that quite a bit especially in lofting. What I recommend is replacing the string in one of these with something that's a bit finer. I'm using some fly fishing backing line down here. Now it doesn't hold the chalk quite as well but it does a pretty good job of laying down a nice crisp line that you can follow accurately. And lastly, a plumb bob comes in handy. Sometimes you just need to find the center of things or when you're setting up molds for building a boat, plumbing them up and plumbing up other parts of the boat are pretty, is pretty important and a plumb bob is really your best bet. We don't need a very long one for doing this. You know, something with a string that's maybe six to ten feet long is more than enough. This is one of those occasions where an antique tool is equally as accurate as a brand new one. Let's bear in mind, if there's anything you can make, it's this. You need a string and something heavy and maybe something to wrap the string around. And that's it. These are all tools you can pretty much improvise. I just want to take a moment to thank you for watching so far. You can support these videos by just subscribing to this channel. But if you really want to help me out, please join me over on Patreon. Over there, I'll have some patron-only content with a real emphasis on education. You'll find a link on my website or down in the description. All right, that's it. Now let's get back to the tools. Moving on to edge tools. We already talked about your knife. If you have to add a second edge tool to your kit, a good quality Sloyd knife or carving knife comes in awfully handy. You do have a lot of little tiny details that only can be dealt with with a knife. I would say 100% necessary and not absolutely necessary. On my tool belt, I carry this one, which probably opens cans of paint and does ugly work more often than not. Let's talk about saws. And my preference is for Japanese saws. The most common is probably the Dazuki style. We have a Ryoba style. This has got a cross cut tooth pattern on one side and a ripping pattern on the other. And this is called an Abziki saw. I'm probably murdering that name. Just like the Ryoba saw, it's got a cross cut tooth pattern on one side and a ripping tooth pattern on the other. Now if all of these saws, this is the one you're going to find in my toolbox. I particularly like the disposable blade variety because in boat work we often get into ugly situations and you can destroy a blade pretty easily and even the worn out blades can come in handy making all sorts of other tools. The other thing to consider is just a western style saw. This is an older saw that was intended for kids but the goal here is to have something that's got a slightly wider kerf to it and you would use this for kerfing joints and larger timbers. We don't need a long saw. This isn't for efficiency of cutting larger materials. This is for getting a nice tight joint between two materials. There's no way we would get anywhere in boat building without planes. The first plane you should be shopping for is a block plane. It doesn't need to be a very expensive one, but it does need to be a good quality. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of very good quality ones being made these days. You may be forced to spend a bit more money than you're comfortable with on this. You could look around for antique ones, but chances you're going to find one of them are a little on the lower side. Just the same, this is another place you want to spend a little bit more money, but you don't need to get fancy. I recommend a low angle block plane. I quite like the fact that they tend to be a little bit narrower in size, just a little more convenient to hang on to. The next size up you're going to need is a smoothing plane. I recommend going for one that's a little bit wider if available. This is a number four. You may have to spend a bit more money to get a decent one, but if you go shopping around antique tool market, you're likely to find one that's a good candidate for a restoration. This one is a record. Stanley's are very good. Lee Nielsen, of course, are great, and Veritas are great too. Of all my planes, these two are the ones that are always in my toolbox. Getting a little more specialized is a rabbit plane. You can get really nice fancy ones and they're beautiful things to use, but more often than not, for general boat building work, you'll probably find this style to be a little more useful. What's good about it is as you're working on larger boats, this D-handle allows you to really sort of get a grip onto it and use it for doing things like fairing out frames. A really nice shoulder or rabbit plane like this is very nice to use, but it's not absolutely necessary. I recommend you try and tack down a nice simple one like this number 78 Stanley. The next size I would suggest is a number 6 4 plane. What's good about this is it's got a lot of mass, and so when you're trying to fair out a larger surface, this will do a nice job for you. If you're trying to flatten an edge, this longer sole comes in handy. I don't feel like you really need to get much longer. In wooden boats, we tend to work on curved surfaces, so long jointing planes are kind of useless most of the time. A number six four plane will take care of whatever straight edge you really need to deal with. The next thing you could consider is a little bullnose plane and a little thumb plane. Now these aren't super useful, but Often you find yourself sort of just chamfering edges quickly, and these are so cheap you might as well have one. 
you're talking about $10 here. These are considerably more expensive. I've tried going with the slightly cheaper route and they really just don't work nearly as well. The adjustability on these cheaper ones are just isn't as good. This is the Stanley number 90. And this one's the Veritas. The Veritas was definitely worth spending the money on. That said, these planes are a complete luxury and you don't need them in your beginner kit. Now, as you get farther into boat building, you might find yourself needing a backing out plane. Now this is something you're just gonna have to make because you can't really buy them. This is just a standard wedge type smoothing plane, but I've rounded over the bottom and the blade. This is a great project if you wanna take a stab at some plane making. The next edge tools we'll talk about now are spoke shaves and draw knives. You'll probably put a fair bit of use into these. Draw knives aren't very expensive. You don't use them every day, but they do a job that no other tool can do quite as well. And spoke shaves you'll use an awful lot. Now I actually tend to use this sort of very simple cheap one most of the time just because I like the feel of it. However, a larger one with, with a higher degree of adjustability is probably a smart idea to have. If you had to pick only one to get started with, by all means, start with the simple one. It'll do everything you really need it to do. The adjustability is just a little bit more difficult on it. Now you're definitely going to need some chisels. For sure you're going to need a simple set which usually comes in a set of four, one inch, three quarter, half inch, one quarter. So you might as well just go ahead and get those. They aren't super expensive and you're going to use them. To that I would add a wider inch and a quarter or inch and a half chisel. I find that comes in very handy. You might go for one that's a little bit shorter like this. That's good for using with mallets. Now we would refer to these as paring chisels. You could also get butt chisels as well, which butt chisels are shorter like this and they're usually intended for striking, whereas these are intended more for just pushing. However, these are intended for all general use. The ones that I would add to that, I would add one of these which is called a pattern maker's chisel. The key here is that these have got a really long blade. This one inch one is made by Sorby and it's got a little bit of flexibility to it. I believe this three quarter inch one was made by Henry Taylor and it's a little bit stiffer. Now, I wouldn't worry about getting both, just one of them is going to be fine. Which one you choose is really up to you. I find them both equally useful. The thing you'll always find in my toolkit is at least one of these and at least one or two of these. Now I'd be lying if I didn't say a really large chisel comes in handy once in a while. Now this framer's chisel, you'll definitely put some use on these at, at some point or another, but I wouldn't worry about getting one until you can afford a really good quality one. Likewise, this is called a boat builder's slick. It's got a long handle and is intended for shaving things down primarily. It's not an absolute must when you get started, but you're eventually gonna want one. This is one of those tools where you pretty much gotta wait until a nice one comes along. They're fairly rare and they can be fairly expensive. The last edge tool you should have on hand is just a simple card scraper. The idea behind these is you, you put a burr on the edge, you crank them over, and you use them to scrape surfaces. Mm -hmm. These usually work best on hardwoods. You use them in all kinds of situations. You can make them yourself too out of old saw blades if you like. While we're talking about edge tools, we need to talk a little bit about sharpening. Your basic sharpening kit is going to consist of a stone, probably a combination stone, and I personally like using diamond stones because they're very durable. They don't last forever, but they do last a good long time, and they can survive being banged around in your toolbox without any maintenance to them. This one made by DMT has got 325 grit on one side and a 1200 grit on the other. That's a, 1200 is about the bare minimum you need to go to for fineness in order to get a good cutting edge. Now in conjunction with that you're going to need a strop. Now this is absolutely something you can make yourself. It's really just a piece of leather on a piece of wood and you want to get your hands on some buffing compound to put on there. Now a bench hook is not really something we would call a sharpening tool but it's awfully useful to have for doing all sorts of cutting operations. But if nothing else, it's a good place to set your sharpening stones on for doing a sharpening operation without messing up the workbench or any other surface you're working on. In addition to that, I always have just a piece of cloth or a shop rag that I'll put my stone on top of when I'm using it. You need to use these stones wet. Whether it's a diamond stone or a water stone or an oil stone, you need to make sure you're protecting the surfaces around you from the residue that comes off of using those. And then lastly, a file. This is a sharpening tool. Now you won't use it on most of your edge tools, but you will use it on your card scraper. It's really important for that. And if nothing else, there's often little things you'll use a file for. If you drop your block plane, for instance, and suddenly you get a little burr on one corner or a, an edge that's, that's a bit bashed up and it's leaving a sharp edge, you might find yourself having to tune that up. So have one on hand, they're dirt cheap, 
you'll find a use for it at some point. Now we make a lot of holes and drive a lot of fasteners in boat building. You're going to want a good drill and driver set. What's probably important here is that you have a driver that can take a chuck up to about half an inch because sometimes we get into drilling some fairly large holes. I recommend you don't try and get one that's too massive though. Having something that's a little bit smaller and more convenient will probably suit you better. You can almost get your hands on a large core to drill when you really need to do big stuff. More often than not, I personally prefer these smaller scale drill and drivers. I find them handier and lighter, and I tend to reach for these before I reach for the bigger ones. Believe it or not, we still make good use of a brace and bit in boat building. We don't tend to drill holes with it, but we do tend to use it to drive screws. When you're driving bronze screws, they can be a little bit delicate, and sometimes you have to be very careful about putting them in. And if you're doing boat repair, getting out stubborn screws is also something you do a lot of. Nothing beats a brace for doing that job. I recommend trying to get one with what we call a very short throw on there and a ratchet. This one has a throw that's about four inches long. They're pretty rare, but if you see one, it's worth snapping one up if it's in good shape. You're also going to want a set of tapered countersinks and you're gonna want a couple plug cutters that match the same size. These are usually 3 8 in diameter and half inch in diameter. We tend to use these a lot, so having a few extra on hand isn't a terrible idea. You're going to want to think about being able to drive for a number 6 screws, number 8 screws, and number 10 screws, mostly. In boat building, we do sometimes get up into the larger sizes. Getting a full set of tapered bits is probably a good idea. One thing I will point out, though, you'll sometimes find this type of cutter that boasts being able to cut a tapered plug. That sounds like a great idea, but in boat building, it doesn't really work for us very well. Tapered plugs usually only grab hold right at the surface of the plug area and more often than not we're putting plugs in and then shaping the wood around them which means that your plug ends up falling out. So just get a straight plug cutter if you can find them. And of course a simple drill index is probably something you should also have on hand. I wouldn't worry about getting a full set up to half an inch to start with. Just one that goes up to 3 8 is probably just fine. Now a couple things I've always found a lot of use for are just some little nippers and a little pry bar. Now this you'll use mostly in repair work, but it can come in handy in all kinds of different ways. The nippers you'll use when you're doing riveting, but also if, if you just have a ball peen hammer, you'll be using this for pulling out nails. Now I call these sanding sticks. This is something you make in shop. Dead easy. You get your hands on some self-adhesive abrasives. These are body files for the auto body industry, which work really, really well. I typically have 80 grit on one side, and 40 grit on the other. These will run about a buck a sheet. They're pretty economical and you get an awful lot of use out of them. But now let's talk about everybody's favorite subject and that's clamps. Now if you're just getting started and you're going to a boat building school, you're not going to need to have your own clamps. If you start a new job, you're not going to need to have your own clamps. But if you're doing anything on your own, you will. My general rule of thumb is when I'm buying clamps, I always buy two. Now in my toolbox, you're always going to find at least two quick grip clamps and you're always going to find at least two spring clamps. They're just so handy, you can't really do without them. Next one I would consider getting are F-body clamps. Just some 6 inch ones are fine to get started. These are also awfully useful because they're so fast to use and they have such a large range. And then following that up, I would consider C-clamps. You want C-clamps because they have a lot of power and they can sometimes hang on to shapes that other clamps can't. You want to have some C-clamps on hand because of all of them, these are going to deliver the most power. The ones you'll always find in my toolbox for sure are these two. They don't have the greatest holding power, but they have the greatest convenience of all of them. Lastly, you're going to need something to put your tools in. I like simple shop-made totes. You can put a few loops of leather or webbing in there to, to hold a few tools and keep them from being damaged. Make sure you make long enough to fit your longest tool. And I find it's a good idea to build some little compartments into it to hold the tools that need the most protection, like your chisels for instance. Build a little box that keeps those edges safe. Got a little pouch on the front here that's just for holding saws and long skinny floppy things. My smoothing plane and rabbit plane fit into these holsters on the outside here. Okay, here's our basic kit. Let's review what we've got. For sharpening, we've got a file, a strop, a sharpening stone, cloth, and a bench hook. For marking and measuring, we've got a tape measure, bevel gauge, combination square, pencils and crayon, and a utility knife, and an awl. For safety, We've got a respirator, 
we've got safety glasses, we've got hearing protection. For edge tools, we've got a basic set of chisels, a pattern maker's chisel, if you can afford to add that to it. We've got a knife again, spoke shave, lock plane, smoothing plane, card scraper, and a saw. For riveting, we've got our nippers and our ball peen hammer. And for drilling and driving, a drill and driver set, tapered countersink, plug cutters, brace and bit. That's the basics. Of all of these things that you could leave behind, it'd be the drill and driver because the brace and bit can do that job for you too. Everything else on here, I would say is as personal as your own toothbrush and you should absolutely have these things on hand no matter where you go. In the category of nice to have it if you can afford it, we've got some marking measuring stuff. We've got our torpedo level, we've got our marking gauge, plumb bob, string line. We've got a larger bevel gauge, a larger combination square, edge tools, a draw knife, a sloyd knife, spoke shave, bull nose plane, thumb plane, rabbit plane, backing out plane, four plane. If I had to whittle this down to just a couple, I would say the rabbit plane and the four plane are the most important ones to add to your tool kit. The other ones are just gravy. For general use tools, a little pry bar, claw hammer. Then of course we've got a larger drill index, the slick the framing chisel, and a wider butt chisel. And then of course some clamps. Lastly, let's not forget about our apron. Don't get overwhelmed by all of this. This little pile is the most important stuff and you could whittle this down even further. If you can only afford only one chisel, just make it a one inch chisel. Just get a block plane. Just get a standard saw. Forget the brace and bit. Forget those drivers if you have to. Forget the card scraper. Forget the tapered bits. Whittle it down to whatever you can afford. I had to whittle this down even further to make it more economical. I'd get rid of the pattern maker's chisel. I'd probably get rid of all but one of the other chisels too. You could get by without a compass you get by without an awl. You could replace the sharpening stone with sandpaper and glass. You can get rid of the file. If I had to have just one plane, I would make it the block plane. Get rid of the brace and bit. You can get rid of the cabinet scraper. You could even get rid of the drill and driver. The nippers you could probably find some lying around. Plug cutters and countersinks they'll probably have wherever you're going. You could go with paper dust masks. That's a much smaller kit now, isn't it? The bench hook you made, but you could always get rid of that. The strop you made, but it could just be a piece of wood with some bumping compound on it. Pencils are free. You can steal a crayon from your kids. You can use disposable earplugs. Who doesn't have a t-shirt on? I would call that sort of an absolute bare bones kit right there. In summary, I'd say shoot for a smaller tool kit, buy the best quality tools you can afford, and try and get the most out of them. In the long run, you're gonna develop a larger, stronger skill set by having a smaller tool kit. And let's face it, there's a lot fewer edges to keep sharp in a smaller kit. to choosing a pencil. Don't choose just any pencil. The number two HP, Dixon Ticonderoga. Choose the world's best pencil. Made with premium cedar and latex-free eraser. Ticonderoga. Ticonderoga.